经开始了，已经开始了。Which is nice、uh, because I mean it's relatively easily available using Chromecast for especially consumers.、Um, there is actually support in DLC, which is surprisingly simple because it's a JSON protocol. You basically select the application that the Chromecast runs, which is a browser application, and then you point it to a URL, and it will just simply stream the stream that's there.、Um, it's There's, as far as I know, there is no currently no free sync implementation available, so that's actually a caveat. That's not that great, and it's not directly designed for screencasting. There might be some applications that are designed to do it on the Google Chrome, but、um, it's nothing that we can readily use currently. And obviously, it only works with the Chromecast and other Google devices, which means you are relatively limited to the amount of devices that you can use. We have AirPlay, AirPlay Mirroring. It's a standard by Apple, obviously.、Um, it has not been fully reverse engineered yet. So, as far as I know, like you, we are able to decode the audio streams because someone actually managed to grab the key out of the proprietary devices. But in the end, it only works with Apple TV, and we can't support that.、Um, and then there's Miracast, which is actually an open. An open standard. It's a Wi-Fi aligned standard, like all the other Wi-Fi standards. It's built on Wi-Fi Direct, peer-to-peer -peer Wi-Fi, which is supposed to enable you to use Wi-Fi with your access point and also connect to one of these devices at the same time,、um, which is in principle fully supported in Linux on the lower stack. So that works. It's Based on the H.264 H.265 codecs, and luckily, even though they are patent encumbered, we do have the Open H.264 codec、uh, encoder these days, provided by Cisco. So we are actually able to create、uh, video streams that are consumable by these devices, and we can use those. So because of this, it's actually possible to implement it and distribute it properly. Um, and the standard documents, like all the 802.11 standards, all the Wi-Fi line standards, are actually available. So you can actually just download the documents and and read them.、Um, there are devices available. It's designed for screencasting. With regard, like there are some extensions and protocols in there to、uh, minimize the jitter. It's designed for for exactly this case. It's designed to minimize the latency. Though I think we don't properly support that really, and there is a, there is an open implementation available too, which is called MiracleCast, and in principle that works, but it's currently not integratable.、Um, so let's talk a bit about the Wi-Fi 
display standard. It's, as I said, it's based on peer-to-peer -peer Wi-Fi. It uses an RTSP contour screen on the background for the for the meter for the connection of uh, controlling the connection. It's an RTP video stream which is commonly used uh, and encapsulated in MPEG 2 TS. So they are very specific in the regard of video that's and audio that's being transported over it. There are in the revision two standards there are further extensions which enable you to uh, stream video directly using other codecs too. Uh, and then you can basically do things like share your screen and then when you want in theory what you could do is if you share your screen and then you like maximize your, your video player, you could automatically detect that and then instead of re-encoding the video stream, send it directly to the device if it supports the codecs available. That would be really cool to support obviously. We are probably never going to support that <laughs> kind of thing. But um, if you had specific support in the video player, then it could just stream directly the video if the device supports it, which is obviously much more efficient because you don't need to decode and re-encode the video stream. Um, as I said, it's H.264, H.265 video uh, encoding, and then it has a number of further extensions, like input back channel, which means that you could uh, you could, for example, use a, have a remote which sends it to the Miracast uh, dongle and then pipes it back to your laptop computer and then wait, you could like, manage the stream playback and stuff like that. Uh, that's supported. That's actually supported in Miraclecast already. Um, there's that direct streaming re without recording with the revision to standard. There's HTCP encryption. We all like that, obviously. Um, it's the same encryption used by DisplayPort and HDMI. I don't think we can ever support that, but I'm, as long as the devices actually accept unencrypted streams, we are fine with that regard to that. We just can't be quite compliant to um, when playing back video, uh, videos or something like that, that set a flag which means you are supposed to send this only encrypted to another device. But it's the general problem that we also always have, right? And it also has I2C pass-through, so you can grab all the information from the monitor. In theory, you can control the monitor. So basically, you have all the protocols available that you have available normally. So you get the EDID descriptor from the monitor, so you can query the display. In I2C generally does allow you to, sometimes allows you to like, set the background brightness and stuff like that. In theory, we could support that. We don't even support that in normal laptop, on normal monitors like integrated. So that's not really that interesting. But in theory, it's all there, uh, which is kind of nice. So this is the overall design of the protocol. This is an image directly from the Wi-Fi display specification. Um, as you can see, by the Miracast device and your laptop connect to the same access point and then you just find it through that. So in that case you will actually be able to see the same device through two, through the, through two different methods because it will both provide peer-to-peer -peer connection and also be connected to the same access point as you are and then you can select which method you want to use. The thing is that if you are using a if you are using the, it's connected to the same AP what will happen is that you can create a TDLS connection, which means that you are again establishing a direct link between the device and the, your laptop and the Miracast device. So if you didn't do that, Wi-Fi would generally always send the data to the access point, and the access point needs to forward it, which obviously means twice the amount of traffic on the, on the Wi-Fi network. 
which is not something that you want because they'll just keep them with world that's available. So then we're going to clear with the uh, with the infrastructure discovery and on that the TCP channel for the first screen, we can see the infrastructure channel. And then there's another it's interesting that that's about the TCP or TCP screen with the RTP data that actually contains all the other information for the stream. So it's actually TS encapsulated in there and the audio stream. And then that might be an with HTC. And um, so as I already said, there are different topics that are possible. So the first one is 50 Wi-Fi, which is both revision one and revision two centers. And there's the TLS with revision two centers and the two revision two. In the peer-to-peer -peer case, which one? Yeah, this is the so this is the TDLS case. This is the peer-to-peer -peer case. We just the, the Wi-Fi sync might be connected to an APU, might be connected to an access point, but you don't need to be connected to any other device to use. Uh, to use Miracast. You can just do a search, it will find cover all the devices that are close by, the audios of which you want to use, you just connect it and over, and then you're doing stuff in the background. Um, with TDLS, you just connect to the access point, you find the device through uh, MDNS multicast DNS. So it's a very standardized method that is easily available with point stories with a value um, for us to, and then you can just um, connect to the Sync it just spring towards it, and actually, like the lower layer, layers, the kernel and also WPS applicant. In theory, they, as far as I know, they do support. I've never tested this, but they do support TDLS out, out of the box. So at some point, the Wi-Fi card will go. Wait a minute, I have a lot of traffic to the Miracast device because it's a video stream, and it will tell the kernel, and then the kernel will tell WPS applicant, okay, please set up a key so that it can send it directly. Creep WPS applicant will do its magic to set up a shared key, and all that is transparent to the user. So, in general, we shouldn't need to care about people just have for a short period of time in order to meet that one and make it much more reliable. Uh, which is not really what to send the data But obviously, that's also possible. So, like if Miracast device was in the internet, you just use the access point that also has support because you can actually buy from that case. You could even use just the wired network in theory. I don't think that's what you're supposed to do, I mean, wired, but it just works. Um, so as I already said, there are two kinds of, uh, of discovery, which is the by just uh, the information on the multicast DNS. So the sorry, that's the first. So the weird thing there is they didn't actually use the standard. Like the Wi-Fi Alliance has a in the future future direct standard. There are discovery methods for finding services and stuff like that. And it can also do things. I think it can even encapsulate uh, multicast DNS inside of those packets. But for the original standard of Miracast, like they split, they actually went in and extended peer to peer standard rather than using the voice there, which is good. So that means that in Wi Fi, in WPS applicant, which is layer, which um, handles all the special managed frameworks earlier, there's specific support for Wi-Fi in, in there, which has to be for forever. So you actually can. It's like uh, on, on WPS applicant, you can set your own Wi Fi display information elements. So in Wi Fi, you, you have like a computer Wi Fi, you use speaker frames. I said you need to use speaker frames, which is the discover metrics points that you discover each other that way. And you just attach more data to that with further, with a Wi Fi display, so the information a little bit attached to that. And that's in that you can show information like what your device can do, uh, which resolution supports, stuff like that. And also information that's needed to such a connection later on, like a DCI keyboard that the RTC service is going to run. That's what you need to process through Wi Fi, uh, Wi Fi display information specific to that. So actually, WPA self can has support for that. And you can just slowly set the information element in WPA self so that it will process with all the frames that you're sending and then we just will do that for you. But we obviously need to set up ready to properly use uh, mirror cast. The other way around, uh, WPA software people also export the elements attached by the period so that you can actually so you know it's a Wi-Fi direct display based on the display and get some information from I want to support. It's it's worse, it's there, all the support is there just like well that they decided to do something on standard. Yeah. And same with the RTSD. The RTSP is actually standard for triple board for screen. Uh, for serving screen, so you connect the RTSP server to you, doing what, what screen is available, and then you, at some point you just say, okay, please send me the screen with this configuration, and it will give you the RTP URL and give you a screen that you can, you can display it. But with Miracast, they figured that that's not really what they need. So what happens there is that actually, it's not normally that the device will connect you to the RTSP server that you're running, but after that, it's like the device starts creating the RTSP server, and it's suddenly the other way around. So the first message in their RTSP variant is that you create a Miracast device. Uh, what it supports, and then it will respond, and then you start querying the next information, and that's how you, then you configure the Miracast device for that. And, it, and then you tell the Miracast device to please start screening from the screen, and then it will space more RGC. However, at any point, there can be uh, specific uh, uh, Wi-Fi display specific commands, which you may intend, like devices allowed to send a list, and a copy refresh screen at any point, and then you're supposed to send a copy refresh screen, and things like that. 
Uh, Further, you can also always send a command to please pass the stream or please reach the stream. Um, these kind of things. And obviously, vendor stuff. And the break extensions do that. Uh, I haven't quite looked into what extensions they are. I, some of them are supported by Miro account at this point. But it's interesting because as I mentioned, there's some issues with getting the latency for it down. So actually, they had more, more Miro uh, commands in the actually to, to improve the situation. And that's what, it's, what it looks like. So, yeah, Miro is just there. It's, uh, it's a working project in principle. It is able to operate with the source and this thing, and it also implements some extensions like the Miro channel. So there is quite a lot of support here. There is a project for the Raspberry Pi, so you can actually just put Miro Pass on the Raspberry Pi, then make it just like a magic version to stream, like, we are probably going to have to do that, which is really nice. Unfortunately, the huge issue with Miro Pass for us to use directly in film is that it doesn't work with Network Manager. So the problem there is that Network Manager can't handle Rupert Kitty. And and that means that what they did was they wrote their own small network team server that's only able to create a gear, which obviously means that means that the whole point of Peer is that you can actually access one and create device in time, but that's still working. So that's up. And that's the one of the biggest issues I've actually spoken about asking them currently. Um so yeah, so in for GNOME, we obviously want need to use screen plus solution and possibly some additional display, which we can support in principle. So that's it. That's where we need to obviously get some passing. We need to be able to stream to the mirror sync, which is mostly implemented in the miracle class. So that's good. Um, we need the integration with the manager, which is like the biggest blocker to actually get to work in um, and a stable fashion on, on this. And then we need a well-designed user tag. So to be honest, that, like for the start, probably something will be a small section where you say, OK, please share my screen now. And it pops up a dialog to basically use the same structure for as uh, the screen, screen sharing for like, um, conferencing is going to use. Um, so for that, we have some supporting much already it's based on Pipewire. And uh, virtual displays, as far as I know, it's not but it's basically the idea is there to support that uh, in much directly. So, in that case, we should be able to use the screen content from Pipewire, set that up, and then put it into your Pipewire sync, which is then going to be yeah. And that should be a pretty, pretty nice solution overall on that side. Um, the screening part of Miracast is also, I mean, we have Miraclecast, which we can use to copy from. And Miraclecast is being developed somewhat actively, and the, um, our Alberto is at the fan. Well, when from by the Wi-Fi device, when the WP supplicant says it support, supports peer to peer on the on the device, so at that point it will just get a fake peer to peer device which is doesn't exist in, at all, which is actually maybe kind of interesting. Wait a second. I'm just thinking. So you can actually see that in this case here, I have one one few right. I have one um, Wi-Fi card. This is my normal Wi-Fi network. And um, WPA supplicant already creates this peer-to-peer -peer device, which is not actually a net dev device. But it's it's there because the Wi-Fi card supports peer-to-peer. -peer. If I then connect to the actual peer-to-peer, peer, -peer, peer uh, establish a connection, then what will happen is that I will get another interface here on the network card, which is either um, of the type group owner or, or of the type peer. And at that point, I can actually use use the network nicely. And on WPA supplicant, I get a corresponding interface to control um, to control that and everything. But right now, I can still already do all the discovery process, discovery things through the uh, management interface, that's what WPA supplicant calls it for. So through the normal Wi-Fi interface on WPA supplicant. So I can discover peers, oh, fine. That's fine. Um, peer discovery works fine. Um, the IP interface will be created when the connection is established, as I said earlier. Um, we are able to handle the Wi-Fi display uh, information elements correctly and um, retrieving it's a bit Unfortunate there that uh, we so WPA supplicant has just one global setting. So in theory, if you try to like find if you have two network cards and you try to find a Wi-Fi display devices with one of them, you will always also set the information elements on on the other network card. And if someone else did a future peer search there, it would be included. We can't do anything about that without uh, fixing up. Uh, WPA supplicant. I'm not even sure if that makes sense. Um, but that shouldn't be a problem because generally, even if you have two network devices, two, two Wi-Fi devices, you're probably only going to use one of them. And even if you have two, it shouldn't be a big deal if a few more, a bit more data is included on the frames. And most of the time, I would expect that you're going to scan on both network cards anyway in that case. You just select 
which one you want to connect uh, on, use for the connection later. The other thing that um, I added was some connection lifetime management, because at some point I noticed that with my script, uh, the WPA supplicant just keeps the connection alive. And the same thing could obviously happen with uh, with network manager that's keeping the connection alive even though my like the screen casting is stopped. So um, the idea is that the casting if I'm basically the idea is that you write a small user space um, daemon that runs in the session, which will provide some DBS API to to the connection to, to, to find the devices using the different methods. This stack so I can display devices and then providing all the streaming and you basically just hook up the pipe wire sync that it provides with the pipe wire storage that you want to use. And at that point, you can stream the video. Um, but then, like, if this if this demon crashed, then obviously network manager should kill the, the, should kill the connection. And that's something that network manager was not yet designed to do. Um, so the idea is that to just attach that the lifetime of the connection with the existence of the DFS, uh Deepest service, and at that point, either the deepest service tears down the connection normally, or if it dies, network manager will just kill the connection, and you're back to square one, um, without having a stray peer-to-peer -peer connection hanging around there for indefinitely until the other device decides to kill it. Um, so yeah, that's just like a short thing that what happens during connection. It's probably not that, well, you prepare the connection, you need to find the peer first, um, you ask for the secret, uh, which is either a pin or a push button on the device. But generally what all devices seem to do that they just, if you say I want to connect with the push button by pressing the button on the device, they just let you connect right away. So basically in, in all cases that are relevant, you probably just do that, connect immediately and the user won't even see that. Um, then you can do provision discovery, which is exactly this. Are you using the pin or are you using, using push button and, and things like that? Um, or the, you can have the disk option to the connect handler and WPA applicant. That's actually just where box in WPA implementation of the uh, connect HTTP server. Create the DHCP server if you're a group owner or DHCP client otherwise. So that's just waiting for the group starting signal from um, NetApp from WPA supplicate, which will notify you that there's a new group, uh, which also means that there's new interface. That once you have a new group, you just ask WPA supplicate, okay, what well, interface is this? Then you grab the interface information from WPA supplicate, then you can grab the information of what the actual current device holds, and at that point, you can, uh, network manager can do its normal thing with regard to setting up the IP country connection on the IP interface that was created by the current. Um, so that works actually indirectly through WPA supplicate rather than directly through network manager works. For most devices, what happens is that network manager sees that there is a new IP device created and then uh, create the corresponding network manager device. But because we already created a network manager device that has the same and final pairs, we are just going to that to the future peer device at the point. And then you can use it normally as every other device. Okay. So at this point, um, does need to up, I need to update some GSTRP server fixes. I saw a lot of minor patches that we done and some related to the Python bindings, actually. And one thing that I needed to start screen, uh, which didn't work because, uh, what was it? Let me think. Um, right, RGSP can actually provide multiple streams, and the RGSP client on the broadcast devices just say play for all of them, basically. And the GStreamer server just wants to know specifically which stream we want to start, even if there's only one. So that's just, Basically, removing the easiest fix is just removing the check, and then it will 